Good morning. How's everyone doing this fine day? Let's open with a word of prayer. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, uh, again, we come to you with great hope and anticipation of a future world with you, Lord. Looking forward so much to that day. And it, uh, looking at this, the Millennium Kingdom that you gave us a view of here in Ezekiel, uh, it just gets us more and more excited for that day that we finally get to uh, be in your presence forever. And we give you all the praise and thanks. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, continuing with the Millennium Kingdom uh, Temple. Uh, now we're in Ezekiel, finish up to chapter 40. Uh, I don't know if we'll get into chapter 41 today or not. Uh, we might just, if it ends a little early, it ends a little early. Uh, we'll see how it goes. And so I guess the Another review, uh, this is a basic outline of the uh, temple and uh, temple area. Of course, the center section is the, uh, uh, let me do this a little differently. So I can kind of point to things. Okay, I got my little cursor here. I hope you can see it. And so we've been talking about uh, to a little review. Uh, we've got the outer court, uh, the outer walls that go around the whole outside. And we've already talked about the uh, gates. And all the gates are the same size and same basic dimensions. Uh, guess what I found a little interesting is that uh, inside the gates is there's, there's like these uh, guard uh, posts. So it uh, makes me curious exactly who's going to man all these guard posts and why they're even necessary. Uh, so uh, some other things that really don't, uh, maybe we'll see uh, as we in our study, uh, maybe it'll come up. The, uh, we already talked about these arches uh, you see around the building uh, quite a bit. And right now we're covering the inner courtyard uh, and that's where we're at right now. And so we'll get back into what we saw yesterday and where we left off. Now we'll be here. And we just finished, we finished up yesterday with these four little tables uh, there at the uh, outset. And they're used for, uh, for killing the sacrifices, getting them ready to come into the uh, altar area. Uh, the altar area is this brazen altar you see in here. That's where the sacrifice is actually burnt. And it, it, as we read uh, based on, on Leviticus, this is the only side the sacrifices were done to the north side of the building of the, uh, of the, uh, from the north gate. Rather interesting that uh, that's the way the sacrifice comes in. And keep that in mind as we go further because you're going to find out later on that uh, this is the, uh, the, the true sacrifice that uh, died for all of us that you'll find out he comes in through a certain gate and we'll find out what that is uh, later on in Ezekiel. So let's get some verses back up here. And uh, let's see, we're moving into chapter... Oh, it's, uh, and move me out of the way so I can see the whole verse. And today we are on chapter 41. We left off at 40. Four tables were on this side and four tables on that side. By the side of the gate, eight tables were upon the slew their sacrifices. So you got eight, eight tables here for sacrifice, uh, for killing the sacrifices. And now we're gonna move into, now these are these little tables. A little bit of a, what they look like. And the four tables were of hewn stone for the burnt offering of a cubit and a half long and a cubit and a half wide. And if I was in the way, you could see what it is in feet. That's two and a half feet square.
half broad and one cubit high. It's not very high. Uh, that's about 18 inches high. Whereupon also they laid the instruments wherewith they slew the burnt offerings and the sacrifice. So it, uh, I guess the uh, the actual knives used for this stuff would be laying on these tables, uh, anticipation of the sacrifice. Now for some of us who've never really had to uh, kill an animal uh, in real life, it's probably a little bit hard to think about this fact, but it, uh, I think we all pretty much know that uh, when we go to the market and buy meat, uh, that, that somehow those animals are no longer with us and they're killed for their meat. Uh, and most of us don't realize that that's, you know, somebody else does that. So it's not uh, totally, un, uh, as long as it's done in a humane way, that God uh, condones that activity and allows us to have meat to eat. Uh, and you can go back to uh, Genesis, uh, right after the flood, Genesis 7, I think it was, 7 or 8, it talks about that, that, uh, that God allows us to eat meat. Uh, so that uh, I know that some people have a little trouble thinking about the fact that we sacrifice stuff, but that uh, it's quite, it's within God's uh, plan. And so I thought I'd pick up a, an interesting verse that I want to talk about here, when I talked about the four tables and the uh, made out of uh, hewn stone. What was interesting is that altars, uh, if you go to his, uh, Exodus 20, 25, it mentions uh, about hewn stone. And it, and it said to make these out of hewn stone. But here in Exodus, it says, if thou wilt make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of hewn stone. For if thou lift up the, thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. So I guess uh, that based on what these tables were done, that they are actually considered polluted. That was in my bio as a reference verse. And uh, right? so the reason I think they put it there is that these tables were of hewn stone so that they were considered uh, polluted. So that uh, with the, with the uh, tools being on it. Okay. And as the one cubit high, I mentioned, I forgot to show you that picture. And that the, uh, the edges, the ledges were one hand breadth. That's one hand breadth is four fingers. So about what four fingers is, I'm not sure what that comes out to. I can take a measure right here, let's see. So an average on four fingers is, at least four fingers for me at the widest point, which would be the knuckles. Yeah, almost three and a half inches, just a little under three and three eighths. So I probably rounded off to three and a half inches about that. A pretty good thick piece of stone, not something you're going to pick up easily. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the next one we're going to move into verse 44. And without the inner gate were the chambers of the singers in the inner court, which was at the side of the north gate. And their prospect was toward the south, one at the side of the east gate, having the prospect toward the north. So interesting thing about these, these uh, buildings, these are the buildings I was talking about. But the two we're talking about right now are these two red ones that show red here. Uh, and these two, verse 44 here, are without the inner gate where the chambers of the singers in the inner court which was at the side of the north gate and their prospect was toward the south one at the side of the east gate having the prospect toward the north and that and the, the other one that uh, this verse is talking about i think it's in the next picture and this would be the ones toward the north Now, it's interesting it uses the word singers because uh, when I was reading that in my reference Bible, it used a different term. And now I want to look at it real quick. Because it used the word priests. 
40. Forty forty four. Oh no, it's further down. Never mind. Yeah, so this, yeah, those two houses. Okay, and then the next. It doesn't talk about uh, verse 45, but in verse 45, it says, And he said unto me, These chambers whose prospect is toward the south is for the priests, the keepers of the charge of the house. So 44 is for the singers. So all you that like to sing, I like to sing too. Uh, that's what these two houses are for over here. And then this house here is for the singers. That's what we're talking about here. Okay, so this uh, this chain was prospect toward the south is for the priest, the keepers of the charge of the house. Okay, I'm a little confused here. I gotta look at this a little closer. Okay, and without and without the inner gate, that's the outside. And outside the inner gate, another way of saying it, were, were the chambers of the singers and the inner court. Which was at the side of the north gate. So it's at the side of the north gate. Let me get first out of here. First. Okay, at the side of the north gate. And their prospect was toward the south, so their doorways are on the other side. We can't see it here. One at the side of the east gate having the prospect toward the north. And that would be the, the red one. It's beside the east gate, but it's prospect toward the north. So it's looking towards the north. And he said unto me, this chamber whose prospect is toward the south, okay, is for the priest. Okay, now I understand. So the one pointing to the south, which would be these two buildings here, is for the priest, the keepers of the charge of the house. And the chamber whose prospect is toward the north is for the priest, the keepers of the charge of the altar, which would be this one here. And the altar is uh, that brown thing uh, in the middle there. This is the verse I was talking about. This is verse 46. Let me show it to you. So we get to uh, verse 46. So I wanted to point to a few things on verse 45 about the keepers of the house. Okay, the keepers of the house, as it has to do with the temple itself. So I want to point to it, and that's over in Leviticus 8.35. Therefore shall ye abide at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Let me move this back just one so that we get the right prospect. We're talking about these two buildings here. So 
So therefore shall you abide at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation day and night, seven days, and keep the charge of the Lord, that ye die not, for so I am commanded. So their sole job is to, uh, that are in these buildings here, is to keep, uh, is to help out, is to be uh, in charge of the Lord, which is inside the temple. So these, again, are priests. And in Numbers 3.27, it tells us who some of these are. And of Kohath was the family of the Amorites, and the family of the Isaiahites, and the family of the Hebronites, and the family of the uh, Uzalites. These are the families of the Kohathites. And the number of all the males from a month old and upward were 8,600, keeping the charge of the sanctuary. So again, uh, these are talking about the priests that are in charge of the sanctuary. And they're all descendants of, uh, ultimately, of, uh, of uh, Aaron. And jumping over to Numbers 3.32, And Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, shall be chief over the chief of the Levites, and have the oversight of them that keep the charge of the sanctuary. So this is the verse that points to who's in charge of the sanctuary. And also, 1 Chronicles 9.23, so they and their children had the oversight of the gates of the house of the Lord, namely the house of the tabernacle bywoods. In this case, the tabernacle, that we're going way back in Chronicles, the tabernacle was a tent, but it's symbolized by the temple also, which would be, still would be the uh, house of the Lord, which is the uh, temple proper. Okay, now to verse 46. So we'll move ahead to this building. The chamber whose prospect is toward the north is for the priests, the keepers of the charge of the altar. These are the sons of Zadok among the sons of Levi, which come near to the Lord to minister under him. So these people here are in charge of the uh, brazen altar. So they're the ones who are taking the sacrifice that's been slain and burning it on the altar. And they also, their main uh, job was to uh, minister unto the Lord. So they're, they're servants to the Lord, whereas the other ones were keepers of the, uh, the other ones probably took care of this stuff in the Holy of Holies. Uh, there was a never ending job in there of making sure that the, uh, that the, uh, uh, the altar of incense never went out and burned continuously and same thing. Uh, and so their job was to make sure that that never went out and so that would be these other gentlemen. So it's a 24 hour a day, seven day a week job. Kind of reminds me a lot of the uh, uh, the uh, guard of the uh, the tomb of the unknown soldiers in Washington D.C. That's manned with a uh, company uh, continuously, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They never take a day off. And there's been even times that a president has authorized them to stop because of a a bad storm or a hurricane. And they are so dedicated to their tasks that they never, they've even gone, uh, as far as I know, there's only been one or two times in the history of the uh, Tomb of the Unknown Soldier where a, uh, a guard was not posted on the, uh, on the tomb. I remember when I was in the military, that was something you could volunteer for. But I'll tell you, uh, it's along the same lines as, uh, as being a uh, priest of the uh, temple that the amount of ceremony involved uh, was very, very high, uh, very dedicated. Uh, you, your uniform had to be perfect all the time. Uh, you had to uh, spick shine your shoes and that uh, your perfect, uh, everything was ironed and starched every day. And if you go, take that to the temple level, uh, when the priests get ready to do their job in the temple, they bathe, uh, they, they, they be, uh, cleanse, they put on their uh, garments that are perfect in every way they're not stained uh, and that uh, they're very uh, symbol symbol symbolized and when it comes to the holy place uh, it's a day in a day out job every single day so very uh, kind of symbolically uh, a little bit like the uh, tomb of the unknown soldier i uh, never really uh, thought much about that but uh, it kind of there's a little bit of a correlation there you know, sometimes wonder because so that tradition goes back all the way to World War One, I, I think, or even earlier than that, maybe uh, some of the original 
uh, the American Revolution. Uh, I'm not sure when it started, uh, but our founding fathers were very, very uh, biblically uh, oriented. I won't say they won't didn't have problems and that they weren't sinners. We all are sinners, but they uh, mimicked the Constitution after the laws of, of God, and that uh, some of these same attributes when it comes to some of the other stuff was probably following some of God's own uh, precepts when it comes to certain things about dedication of service. So it's a interesting correlation. So let's see, where am I? Uh, verse 46. And the chamber was prospect toward the north as for the priests, the keepers of the charge of the altar. These are the sons of Zadok, among the sons of Levi, which come near to the Lord to minister unto him. So again, this is another verse that kind of uh, I point to that uh, tells me that this temple area is only for the Jewish people uh, and normal business of the, and it doesn't mean we won't go there and worship the Lord, uh, but I think that the actual people working at the temple are going to be uh, Jews out of the tribe of Levi, and God has kept track of, uh, and probably uh, has it all set up. Who those going to, who are they going to be in the Millennium Kingdom? So a little bit about uh, this particular. The keepers of the altar, the sons of Zadok, and over in Ezekiel 44, 15 and 16, it tells us a little bit more about them. But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, that keep the charge of my sanctuary, and the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister unto me. They shall stand before me and offer unto me the fat and the blood, saith the Lord God. So it looks like they're going to take the sacrifice from the brazen altar, and they're going to present it to the Lord, who is a uh, ruling and reigning from Jerusalem uh, in the Holy of Holies. That's a, this is a future verse when we get to chapter 44. Also verse 16. And they shall enter into my sanctuary and they shall come near to my table to minister unto me and they shall keep my charge. So they're going to be a personal uh, uh, represent, uh, bringing uh, the sacrifice to the Lord. And uh, and talking about the, uh, I was talking about the constant fire. Uh, that's over in Leviticus 6:12. And the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it; it shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning, and lay the burnt offering in order upon it. And he shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offering. And the fire shall ever be burning unto the altar; it shall never go out. So again, just like the uh, altar inside uh, for the uh, for the uh, prayers of the saints, the altar outside. The brazen altar has to be maintained and lit all the time. And so this is where I get the idea. It has to be the house of uh, Levi. If you go to Numbers 1640, uh, it mentions here, to be a memorial unto the children of Israel and no stranger, which is not of the seed of Aaron, come near to the offer incense before the Lord, that he be not as Korah, and as his company, as the Lord said to him by the hand of Moses. So that no one but the descendants of Aaron could come near to the Lord uh, in this. And now numbers, of course, we're talking about the original uh, tabernacle. But that uh, God usually, when he sets up a rule, uh, maintains that rule all the way through. And I can't see that this temple will be uh, that much different. We're seeing a hints of that in some of the verses. Okay, Ezekiel 40, uh, verse 47. Oh, still not to that picture yet. So he measured the court and a hundred cubit long and a hundred cubit broad, four square, and the altar that was before the house. And just to uh, show what that is, get the verse out of the way here. That inner court, that red area that you see in there, uh, basically from uh, that it's a uh, 100 cubits across and uh, let me bring that verse back up so I at least read it verse 47 so he measured the court 100 cubits long and 100 cubits broad four square and the altar that was before the house so they're talking about this area inside here so if you can see my cursor I'm drawing a square 
that's the area of the altar. And that's 100 by 100 uh, cubits. That's a big area. Uh, that would we say 100 cubits was? 75 feet. And so that uh, that's a good size, size of an area. Oh, it's got to be more than 75 feet. 100 cubits. Uh, that's more than 100. That's 150 feet. Where is my reference on that? Yeah, 150 feet. So basically from uh, gate to gate inside here, it's 150 feet. And from the uh, east gate here until the uh, door of the temple is 150 feet. That's a pretty good size area. Uh, this drawing probably doesn't do it justice. Okay, now on to the next picture. And this, uh, I should have pointed to it before. This is the actual entryway. If you kind of look out through this doorway and look out, you can see those little buildings we were talking about uh, over here. Yeah. So that's one of those buildings we were just talking about. And you can see that, that those are the ones that are ministering to the uh, altar. They can basically see right in here. Uh, two beautiful poles here. They have a, a very interesting meaning also that we'll talk about. And he brought me to the... Oh, let me bring some verses back here. And he brought me to the porch of the house and measured each post of the porch five cubits on this side and five cubits on that side. And the breadth of the gate was three cubits on this side and three cubits on that side. And uh, as the three cubits, you see the little area there in the uh, so that little, you know, that's what they call the gate, the width of the gate. Now length is 20 cubits, which we'll get to in verse 49. But first I wanted to talk a little bit about the porch. Got some references over in 1 Kings 6.3. And the porch before the temple of the house, 20 cubits was the length thereof according to the breadth of the house, and 10 cubits was the breadth thereof before the house. So you can see that the original uh, uh, Solomon's temple was also uh, this size. Uh, some of these dimensions are exactly the same. Now we're in 2 Chronicles 3, 4. And the porch that was in the front of the house, the length of it was according to the breadth of the house, 20 cubits, and the height was, a, was 120 and he overlaid it within with pure gold. So that's talking about the, uh, the, the actual posts there. Okay, verse 49. The length of the porch was 20 cubits and the breadth 11 cubits. And he brought me by the steps whereby they went up into it and there were pillars by the posts, one on this side and one on that side. And that's talking about the two breasts Oh, actually, yes, I believe that's, I'm not sure that, yeah, it's brass. Uh, and we'll see here in a minute that, that, that at least one of them I found a good meaning for. The other one I wasn't exactly positive about. Well, if we go to 1 Kings 7.15, talking about the pillars. I'm going to read 15 through 21. For he cast two pillars of brass of 18 cubits high apiece, and a line of 12 cubits did compass either of them round about. And he made two chapters of molten base brass to set upon the tops of the pillars. The height of one chapter was five cubits and the height of the other chapter was five cubits. And the nets of the checker work and the wreath of the chain work for the chapters were upon the, this is a description of these poles, much more detailed than we got here. Uh, upon the top of the pillars, seven for the one chapter and seven for the other chapter. 
And he made the pillars and two rows round about upon the one network to cover the chapters that were upon the top with pomegranates, and so did he for the other chapter. I'm mainly reading this to get to the last verse. And the chapters that were upon the top of the pillars were of lily work and the porch and four cubits. And the chapters upon the two pillars had pomegranates also above, over against the belly, which was by the network. And the pomegranates were 200 rows round about and upon the other chapter. And he set up the pillars in the porch of the temple, and he set up the right pillar and called the name thereof Jaselin. And he set up the left pillar and called the name Boaz. And anyone who studied Ruth has heard that name Boaz before. A little bit about these two names. <clears throat> it's interesting that uh, all Jewish names have meaning. And so uh, Jackson, Jachin, Jachin uh, is called He Shall Establish. And Boaz means in it is strength. So he, so between these two poles we get he is established in its strength. But another uh, interesting correlation, uh, I've always loved uh, Oh, one more verse about these in Second uh, Chronicles 3.17. He read up the pillars before the temple, one on the right hand and, and the other on the left, and he called the name of that on the right hand, Jachin, and the name of that on the left, Boaz. I thought I'd just mention, it's kind of interesting where the word, where Boaz comes into the, uh, oh, it's kind of interesting that it's at the entryway into the temple, and we know that Jesus is going to rule and reign there. But over in Ruth, uh, Boaz was very instrumental in uh, bringing the, uh, continuing the line uh, of Christ up to into David. And we see this in Ruth 4, 21 and 22. And Salmon, Salmon begot Boaz, and Boaz begot Abed. And Abed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. And David would be the uh, king. And the other thing that we'll get into when we talk more about this uh, temple is that somehow David is involved. We'll get into that as we get later in the chapters here, uh, where uh, it does mention David quite a bit as the prince, uh, uh, kind of under King Jesus, and that he'll be in instrumental uh, in this temple also. So I think it's interesting that his uh, grandfather, I think that's grandfather, uh, Obed begat Jesse and Jesse begat David. So David, Jesse would be his father, Obed would be his grandfather, and so, uh, great-grandfather. So Boaz would be great-grandfather to David. Interesting, they named one of the poles after him. And I'm sure that Jason, Jachin, has a uh, meaning also. I tried looking it up and really couldn't find anything uh, definitive on that one, except what its meaning is. And so we're gonna, I'm going to end there today, and uh, we'll get into uh, we'll say this ends chapter 40, and that worked out pretty good. Another half hour or so, you know, it's a little over. So uh, I'll end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, oh, thank you so much for this time to uh, look into your word. And thank you so much, Lord, for all that you do for us. I can't praise you and thank you enough. Uh, Maranatha, Lord, uh, come quickly. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. If you're uh, in my class on S Sundays, uh, I just brought up that term Maranatha. I just found out for myself in the study of Daniel we're doing uh, in church on Sundays, Sunday morning, that uh, Maranatha, uh, besides meaning uh, that uh, God, co uh, Jesus come quickly, uh, it's actually Aramaic. Uh, and so uh, we're finding out in Daniel that uh, when it applies to the Gentiles, that, uh, that the book of Daniel is written in Aramaic. Kind of interesting. So, uh, as I, uh, one of my favorite Bible teachers uh, says, that uh, there's no such thing as coincidence when it comes to uh, God. Uh, everything has a reason for being there. And that uh, it's just a matter for us to try to figure out what that meaning is. So again, uh, uh, I hope that you all have a great day. And if you're new to uh, my little broadcast here each morning and you don't know the Lord yet, uh, please stay tuned. There'll be a video playing after this 
uh, that will tell you about how you too can become a child of God and get in, and find heaven on you through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. So stay tuned uh, and I'll you know, explain to you how you too can be in heaven as we all look forward to that day. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. And I'll see you all later.